Welcome back to Clinical Psychology Community UK. My name is Holly and I have just started my second year on a clinical psychology doctorate training programme in the UK. Today we're going to be talking about some of the top tips for applying to the doctorate in the UK. I just want to say, without it sounding a bit shameless plugging, um, I have done a really long detailed video on this that goes through the whole process of applying, so I'll make sure I link that down in the comments below. But for today, we are going to be covering top tips for the application. Just a few tips that will hopefully be helpful for you. So let's get into it. Here are some of the basics about the doctorate that you need to know. It is a doctorate in clinical psychology, and we often abbreviate it to DCLIN or DCLIN Sci, and that is because that is the award that you're given at the end. So, uh, like when you do a, a Bachelor of Science, a BSc degree, um, BSc then goes at the end of your name, um, and it's kind of the same with DCLIN Sci. It will go at the end of your name. So that's like the abbreviated form of, of what the doctorate is, basically. It's a three year full time course and I think there is only one part time course available at the moment but I think there's a lot of talk about uh, improving that and um, because it's a bit more accessible to be able to access it part time for people that have other commitments and families and children um, so hopefully there will be more available soon but at the moment I believe there's only one available. Please correct me if I'm wrong. There are currently 32 universities in the UK that offer a DCLIN side course. Um, the programme consists of teaching, research, academic assignments and placements. Um, if you want, th there are various entry requirements as well that are related to perhaps having a psychology undergraduate degree or a master's conversion. They may have a grade that's specified in that as well. Clinical experience um, and some courses suggest a minimum amount, so minimum six months or a year. Some don't specify. Um, and then research experience. Um, some places might specify that they want you to have some audit or service improvement experience. Um, but it's really important to go to the Clearinghouse website that I will link down below. It'll be the first link on there. Um, it will detail all of the courses. You can have a little look, see what you want to do. So there's course pages on Clearinghouse and they will also hopefully have links to their own websites that will hopefully be updated. But Clearinghouse is the best place to go because it has a huge amount of information on there. But those are the Deakin site basics. Let's move on to choosing your courses. So you are only able to apply for four courses. Um, so it may be worth really thinking about which ones you want to apply for and which ones you are going to have the most success with. The first way that I like to choose this is with ethos or with values, which is what the courses see as important in training. Um, for example, the course that I'm on um, advertises the fact that it embeds people with lived experience throughout the teaching and research, um, and that was really important. Some courses are really strong on reflection. Some courses are really big on widening access and assertive outreach. It really depends on what you want to do. So having a clear understanding of what you want to do with when you're on the course will really help you choose the courses. Um, so I think absolutely have a look at what's out there and see what grabs your attention. Um, but also important to have a think about you, which we'll come on to. Secondly is location. So this is quite a big one. Um, as there are only 32 unis in the country that do it, you know, you need to think about where you'd be happy to live for the next three years, potentially, or happy to commute to. Um, and are there any extra requirements to that? So some courses specify that you have to live in a certain place. Some don't mind you commuting and they can be flexible with that. But it's important that if location is something that's um, crucial for you or perhaps more inflexible or rigid, it's important to know what the scope is on the course. So it could just be contacting them and saying, look, this is my situation. I'm a carer for one of my parents or a family member, and I can't really leave them um, a lot, so I can't move, but I, I'm happy to do the commute. It could be a conversation like that and see what they think. But that's a really important one, I would say. And then finally, entry. So what we mean by this is play to your strengths, um, thinking about the shortlisting tests, strength of application form, written tasks, interview tasks. So for me, I was not so great at the shortlisting tests, like at all. I did it for a couple of years out of the six that I applied and I never got shortlisted because of the screening. test. Oh, I did once actually. I got shortlisted once because of a screening test, but then I stopped applying to them because it just wasn't working. And I thought, felt that I had a stronger application form given the number of years that I had been 
um you know practicing and learning and, and things um and applying I thought that was a bit stronger for me so I chose to do it that way but you might think actually you know the, I do really well at these tests so I'm going to do that and that's that's fine too but I think it's really important you've got four choices basically choose the ones that you think you're going to have a chance with see how they interview do they do online interviews do you hate online interviews and you'd rather a face-to-face -face? think about those things um, and while the interview is important, it is also important. I think it's probably more important to see how they are. It's to check that your values line up. I think that's the most important thing, although these things are very important. So these are the questions that I get so often is like, how do I write my personal statement? How do I how can I be reflective in my personal statement? What am I supposed to be doing? Biggest piece of advice is show someone what point you're making and don't tell them. So if I were to say something like, um, I have lots of experience with people uh, from marginalized groups, therefore I'm gonna be a good trainee. Well, how? How are you How are you gonna be a good trainee? It might be something like uh, that you're talking about a particular client that you've worked with, anonymized obviously, talking about a particular client that you, that you worked with and thinking actually they were from a different uh, background, different culture to me, and I had to really understand how what their experience, what their experiences have been, have been completely different to my experiences, and how their experiences have shaped who they are, and actually formulating all of that, and also paying attention to the differences between us was really important. And I know that on training, that's going to be an important factor to, to consider when doing therapeutic work and even research. That's why I'm a better candidate for training. So that's a way that you can, you know, you're showing a little bit more. You're not just saying, I've done this, therefore I'm good at this for training. That's one of my pieces of biggest advice. But in terms of planning your personal statements, this is what I did. I wrote three lists. I wrote my biggest lessons. I wrote why I wanted to be a clinical psychologist at those chosen courses. And I also wrote a list of my competencies so far, or what I felt were my competencies. And not just the things that I was competent in, but the things that I didn't feel very competent in as well. Um, and then this led me to think about the things that felt most important to me and my chosen courses. So I wrote about managing imposter syndrome, lessons from supervision, and, and specific lessons about kind of being curious and... Um, finding my own voice uh, to voice that curiosity and thinking that's okay rather than being so nervous that I don't understand something like being able to use that voice and then my experience working with marginalized groups um, that was really important to me and, and um, there's a big emphasis on that on lots of the courses that I applied to so would I do anything differently um yeah, I think I would. I would write a list with my biggest mistakes and I'd use reflective models to kind of reflect on them to see how they make me a better candidate for training. And to some extent, I did do that with my biggest lessons, but I think I was so, I wanted to shy away from the times when I really make a lot of mistakes. The word mistakes was something I tried to avoid, I think. So that's something I would try and tackle head on now. Um, and I would also consider a list of all aspects of training and how I feel ready for each of them because actually having you know done a year of training there are lots of things that I felt actually really prepared for and lots of things that w came as a bit of a surprise so it's yeah I, I think it's really important to think about the, the aspects of training that you're really looking forward to and also the ones that you're nervous about because it's it's good to have an awareness of those things so this is what I did to plan for my personal statements. Um, and this may be helpful for you. It may not be. You know, I'm, I'm a massive advocate of everyone having their own way of doing things. I'm not here to tell you that this is the only one way to do it, because that's not true. Everyone has their own way. And you will have loads of fantastic ways of doing this already. So whatever works for you works for you. Don't change that. Um, but here is here's a little bit of advice. Um, so here are some of the questions that can really help you reflect, because that's actually what this section is, particularly that first question, you know, in what way did your work and or research experiences have made you a better candidate for training? That, that sort of question. Here are some of the things that can help. What are the key aspects of the courses that attract you? Is it the uh, secondary therapeutic modality? So for me, that's systemic, and that was something I really wanted to learn. 
Um, is it something about a specialism that they have? Is it like a neuro specialism? Is it health specialism that they can help you get involved in? Is it the wide range of placements? Is it their focus on involving people with experience? Is it their focus on assertive outreach? Really think about those core. Each course have a list of things. I, that that was one of the things that helped me just understanding each course that I was applying to and why I wanted to study there. What are your biggest lessons? What are your biggest mistakes? Um, why do you uh, why do you want to be a clinical psychologist? That's supposed to say. Sorry, guys. Why do you want to be a clinical psychologist? Why do I feel ready to undertake training and why now? Um, what am I most worried about thinking about starting training? Are you worried about having to move away? Are you worried about managing imposter syndrome? Are you worried about um, which, which bits are you worried about or which bits are you looking forward to? And what have, what have been the hardest things I've been through, professionally and personally? How do these difficult experiences make me a better candidate for training? And what sort of clinical psychologist do I want to be? Where do I want to fit in the system? And which aspects of training do I feel most and least ready for? Now, these may not be things that you write in your personal statement. Like, you can't include all of this necessarily into to much depth. But what's really important is having an understanding of this stuff. Because unless you've done, I, I personally believe, a load of reflection about who you are and where you want to fit in the system and what clinical psychology is and what it means to you and where you want to take it, then I think it's quite hard to just focus on a few different things. I think it's quite good to have a broad understanding and uh, reflection on lots of different things. And then you can choose the bits that feel most important. It might be like, actually, one of your biggest lessons was a huge thing that stayed with you throughout your whole career um, and it's something that you will bring to training so that would, might be something really relevant it might be that you actually you haven't learned a lot from the mistakes that you've had and that might not be relevant to go in there and that's fine um, but these things will help you get to a place where you're a little bit um, more informed maybe and aware of, of, of some of the answers to these so Another one is uh, choose a few experiences that were difficult for a range of reasons. So you could choose uh, an example of client work that didn't go as well as you wanted or a challenging professional situation um, and really reflect on them. I would suggest using reflective models. This was some feedback that I had before I started the channel. Um, it was uh, 2020 I interviewed for a course and the, it was a, obviously I didn't get on. Um, and the feedback was that I should use some reflective models to better understand my experiences, to be able to talk about them in a more succinct way. So that's sort of why I started this, because I didn't really know any reflective models. And I also wanted to get better at speaking because I just thought I was never going to get past an interview stage um, because I would used to get really tongue tied and not really know what I wanted to say. And having done the reflection, I realised actually that was one of the pieces that was missing it's not just confidence in my own voice it was actually just reflecting on some of those models as well so I've done loads of videos on, on models right I'll link them all down below so you can use them and also if you want to drop me an email I can definitely send you some templates I haven't worked out a way to do that any other way yet but um drop me an email and I'll send you the templates for all of these because these can be really really helpful now, I'm going to talk through the Gibbs one, which everyone might have heard of, and that's fine too, but I'm just going to talk through the Gibbs model briefly and give you an example about how I might answer that in linking to training. So the Gibbs model looks like this. So you start with a description of what happened, then you move to thinking about thoughts and feelings that seem significant. So what sorts of things came through your mind or, or did you feel during that situation or um, afterwards when you were reflecting? Then we move on to evaluation. So that's good and bad parts. So things that went well, things that didn't go so well. And then moving on to analysis, making sense of that situation. And then conclusion, what have you learned and what could you have done differently, which then helps you make a bit of an action plan for the future. So that's a really simple one. I have done a full video on this. So if you are interested in it, then go and have a look there because I talk through some different examples. For this example, I was talking about experiencing burnout. Um, and this is a really quick one to do, but you also can go into a lot more depth with it. So um, I would imagine, um, you know, if I were actually doing this in terms of 
um, applying, I would spend a lot more time doing this and it would be probably more detailed. But just for the purposes of this, just to demonstrate it, experiencing burnout um, and what I'd probably include in that is where I was working at the time, the circumstances that led to that, not just within the work setting, but also the rest of life. Um, because there were influences on that and it's important for the learning to understand what your triggers are for this um so thoughts and feelings I just thought well I can't do this I'm never going to be <laughs> good enough for training because I can't even handle this and training is so much more stressful than this and I'm going to be terrible and it made me feel scared and it also it made me feel scared because I was nervous about starting like trying to do training how was I ever going to be able to do that if I can't even handle what I'm doing now um, but there's also something about um, being scared in case I fail, really. Um, so those were some of those things that felt really salient. And then evaluation. I mean, this is really, really like reductive, but the good bits, I learned some resilience and and learning effectively. I, I learned more about myself. I learned more about what my triggers were and how to manage in situations where I might be experiencing burnout. Learned what my early warning signs were and I actually learned how to look after myself as well um and bad on the bad side it was really difficult emotionally um to experience that compassion fatigue when I was in a place where I really wanted to help and I could have you know I felt like I could make a difference but there were certain systemic factors that just weren't helping that so it made the burnout worse um and then turning to analysis there's something about power here as well as a pre-training psychologist I think it's difficult because we're simultaneously in a powerful group because we're mental health professionals who are educated, you know, who have experience and also their their professional voice can contribute to real life altering, important decisions to people's lives. But we're also part of a disempowered group because, you know, we're not qualified staff. We're on some of the lower wages out of all of our colleagues and because we're not qualified our voices might in in the team might often get dismissed so that's really hard um but also that power dynamic kind of makes you want to work 100% like work so 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 hard because you know how can you say that you've done your best unless you've actually done your best and you've done 100% or 110% and I think that's why I put family scripts in brackets because that was always a, a you know for a lot of people I think it's in their family script do your best and you'll achieve um, so I think there's there's a whole load of stuff there um, that really I could go into in much more detail. Um, but the other thing on the analysis was competition, because, and I do touch on this later, there is a huge amount of competition. You know, it, it's massive. Um, so it's, it's really tough. Um, and I think that is one of those factors that will maintain the working hard and striving behaviour. So that's an important one to remember. Um, in terms of conclusion, I learned my, what my triggers were for experiencing burnout and some of those early warning signs. And I also learned that my well-being needed to be protected. It's not just something that's going to be a given. It was something I actively needed to work on to protect, particularly in the system that we work in and that we live in. That's something really important. So in terms of the plan, I was planning to protect my well-being, checking in with myself, planning nice self-care activities, making sure that I could turn off work when I left the office that sort of thing and also being realistic about tasks that I had to do and asking for help um so you can see there that just that one experience of burnout you know that that even as chronic as it was you you can have a whole load of different reflections and that was really really brief but actually how good what what use is this if I can't link it to training so in terms of linking to training um I also I learned how to look after myself and protect my well-being which will be important for training when you're managing all the demands of training research academic clinical placements all the stuff that you have to do being able to understand how to protect your well-being to be able to get the best results is really important and also it's an understanding of a really common experience for clients will come to you experiencing burnout for lots of different reasons and so will colleagues there's and you know we've gone through one of the most challenging things that any people can go through which is the pandemic and NHS staff it's been hard um and we're seeing more and more NHS staff accessing services for support with burnout and things so 
having an experience can be really, really helpful for helping people in terms of therapy and, and understanding where they're coming from. Not that it's essential, but it's just sometimes really helpful. So hopefully you can see how that reflection, reflective model from an experience that I had that was really, really difficult has linked back to training a little bit. And there's lots of different ways you can word this in your statement, or even you may not even use this in your statement, but it's really important to help understand your experiences better um, to understand why you're a better candidate. So more on personal statements. Um, always link your point back to the question for every question, but I am particularly thinking of the longer one, the first one, in what way have your work and or research experiences made you a better candidate for clinical training? I see so many statements where nobody, they don't link it back. And the thing is, if you're just going through a list of reflections, you're not answering the question. You need to think about which particular aspect of clinical training you are prepared for because of those experiences and how you are better prepared. So always link it back to the question. And if don't worry about cutting something if you can't link it back to the question. It's not worth the characters. If you can't link it back, get rid. Also think about where the information goes, making sure you're putting it in the right section. So if you're talking about dissemination of anything, it may be best in question two. Please give details of any publications or dissemination resulting from your work. Your personal statements are for reflection not listing your experience, as this will go in your experience section. What I mean by this, in your dissemination section, you may have a list of the things that you've done. That's that's fine. Um, but it, I see lots of question one statements where, you know, in what way have your experiences made you better candidate? People will just list, when I was an assistant psychologist, I did auditing and I worked with clients and I did low intensity CBT, blah, 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 blah. And that's why I'll be good for training. That well, that all that is in your experience section. But what did you learn from that? You know, make it make sure it's not generic. So many assistants could write that. Loads, everyone probably could write that. So, what's specific to you? What have you learned from those experiences that you can put in there? Because you want you to come across in those statements, not someone else that's random and generic. The other thing I would say is you probably have disseminated and or created something. So make sure you put it in there. This could be. Um, it could be like materials for clients, groups, colleagues, um, CPD, any training that you've done. It, you will have created something. So make sure you sell yourself and put it in there. And if you can't think of anything, just spend some time with it and go back through the experiences that you've had and write down some notes. I promise you will have something to put in there. I left it blank for the first couple of times because I didn't think I had anything. I absolutely did. So make sure you put something in there. And also the um, courses that you're applying for, make sure you link something back to those courses. And this is particularly true for question three, what would you hope to gain from training? Because this is your place to say, I really want to learn about systemic. If it's a systemic course, I really want to um, do some assertive outreach if it's that sort of course. Really think about the specifics of the course that you're applying to and tailor it to them. Um, because that is where they'll be looking. To, do they understand what they're getting themselves into? Do they have realistic expectations of what training is? Because if you say, well, I hope to gain uh, 10 publications and write a book by the end of training, that that's just not realistic. You know, it's just not. So um, it, it, make sure that what you're doing comes across as realistic. <laughs> Now, that is my, those are my top tips on the personal statements, but I, I think it's really important to speak to this, managing the stress. This can be a stressful process. It also might feel fairly straightforward for some people. Everyone experiences this differently, and it's important to remember that. Not everyone is going to find this easy. Not everyone is going to find this really hard, but you might. So learning how to manage the stress is important. Make sure you give yourself time to draft if that's the way you work. I'm the sort of person that likes to do drafts and drafts and drafts and really, you know, finesse every little bit because the character count here is so tight. That's what I wanted to do. So make sure you give yourself time to draft if that helps. And also make sure you have some fun things scheduled to do. But, you know, particularly for once you've submitted it, because it is an achievement to get the whole thing in. Like it's, it is an achievement. So make sure you reward yourself for that. It's really important. I just have a couple of comments on the process because it doesn't feel right to do one of these videos at the moment. 
having reflected on the whole process and and there's so many flaws the system is flawed right we know this and I'm not just going to start complaining about it but there are two points that I think are really important to remember when you are going through this process um firstly paying to apply for a job is really oh what's the right diplomatic word it's very difficult um because you know what you're doing is disadvantaging those from a non or underprivileged community you know how is this helping to widen access like how are we all the courses say we're really committed to this yet it's easier for them to go through a clearinghouse for example because it's one centralized place that manages it all they don't have to then sort all the admin because it's all sorted and easier but actually what that means is that you have hundreds of people that may not be able to afford to apply simply because of a characteristic that should be protected it, it's it's tough so yeah it, it doesn't feel right not to speak to that um and one of the things that they offer is that you can save 10 pound for applying early um so yeah which which on on the surface is like great yeah wonderful but what if you are from a a you know a place where you're a full-time carer and you're also working and you're also trying to apply getting it all done early it might add considerable pressure to you and actually that's an unfair disadvantage um so I think these things really do need to be considered. Um, there is something called Declan Sign Mutual Aid. There's a few different things like this, and I could only find this one. Um, it's a Twitter thing, and I'll try and put the link down below. It can help because this is where someone might hashtag Declan Sign Mutual Aid and say, I can pay for one person to apply. I can pay for three people to apply. Um, so then you can you can apply for that. There won't be any questioning uh, or, you know, are you sure? it's really a goodwill system. So some people will be able to access uh, applying for it for, for the decline side for free because someone else has covered that fee. It is a it, it, what feels like a brilliant process on one hand. Of course it is like it's it's really helping helping to widen access. But secondly, on the other hand, it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be up to it's always the way when there's a, a problematic system, it, it relies on people with goodwill to fix that system rather than actually overhauling the whole thing. So anyway, I will put the link down below for Declan Side Mutual Aid. Secondly, I just wanted to talk about competition. Um, many courses have hundreds of applicants for a handful of places. My course had over 660 applicants for 36 places. That is huge. That's just you know, is mammoth. And it's really easy to internalize that lack of success to mean that you're flawed. But trust, the system is flawed. And that's the most important thing to remember. And I know, believe me, I know after not getting on for five years, I know how awful that is when someone says, oh, it's just the system. Like, yeah, it is. The system is flawed. But hope there's so many people that are trying to contribute to widening that access and making things a little bit easier for people. And also trying to change the system. It's just these things take such a long time. But it's not you, it's the system. And learning how to play the system will help. So things like this and all the other YouTubers that are out there that help, Oxford Psych, Sharon B, you know, they, they are there to help. Um, so make sure you access all the information that you can to give yourself the best chance. Rant over. Massive good luck for your application and for the interview process. Um, make sure that you have time for self-care and thank you so, so much for watching. It really does mean a lot. Please comment down below if there's anything at all that you want to see and make sure you follow us on the Instagram as well and subscribe and hit the bell and then you'll get all the updates for future videos. Thank you so much. Take care, bye-bye.